This program contains graphic material, including offensive language. Viewer discretion is advised. Today, we are preparing to take over the USA. Get out! Tomorrow, the world. We know where you work. We know where you live. You're not that hard to go. The capital of Ohio, and home to some 750,000 people. The city sits in the heart of it all, within 550 miles of half the population of the U.S. Columbus is every town USA. I mean, it's Midwest. It's not real cosmopolitan, but it's your everyday people. This is middle America, personified. Columbus also has a criminal network to rival any city. It is a place where those that might be disposed to do that kind of thing think that they can be undetected. Among the most notorious gangs here, the Aryan Republican Army, or ARA. They were misfits and losers, radical neo-Nazi white supremacists who wanted to overthrow the federal government and install a white supremacist dictatorship. And they also really liked guns and bombs. We basically have three general objectives. Eliminate the government, exterminate and repatriate all non-whites with their lands. That's it. The ARA is also known as the company. The gang has built a reputation for robbing banks. 22 since 1994. And pushing its racist agenda. And our belief system went on if we can rob enough banks, we might be able to fund a race war of some sort and give our bounty to other racist groups and, and help them flourish. There has to be means to resist. Well, then you need the logistics to resist. Well, then you need the funding to get the logistics. So all these things taper together, and you know, before you know it, I mean, it's all a criminal enterprise. 38-year-old Sean Kenny is a former ARA associate. He was raised by his dad after his parents' divorce. Having a single father as a parent gave me a little bit more latitude to be a little freer. At age 18, Kenny began hanging around white nationalists. I kind of got into it at the time when it started taking off. That was my whole world. I mean, that was my life. His views soon became more politically extreme. The next step for me at that point then was, you know, who's the most active? Who's out there really trying to do what needs to be done? And the ARA's anti-government message resonated. They were professional bank robbers. They had a political and spiritual ideology of white supremacy that binded everything together. One man's terrorist is another man's patriot. The ARA has two leaders. One is Peter Kevin Langan, aka Commander Pedro. A lot of people know something is rotten here in America. I want you to understand that we will do whatever is necessary to achieve the ultimate goal to liberate this land. Yeah. Of average height with long red hair, Langan doesn't look like a criminal mastermind. 
He's not somebody that you would think fit the ideal role. I mean, he seemed more or less, I guess, what you would call kind of like a hillbilly type person. But Langan is a racist extremist, obsessed with firearms and explosives. Extremely manipulative and conniving, extremely intelligent and probably would be somewhat amused to be written off as a kook. We need to quit crying and it's all going to die. The other leader is Richard Lee Guthrie Jr., a.k.a. Commander Pavel. must be a concerted effort amongst those who are willing to act, not react. Guthrie is a loner who hates the government. Guthrie is always, apparently from his high school days, a bit of a racist and outsider. He honed his criminal skills at an early age. Guthrie's family was in the printing business, and that's where he learned all the techniques for forging IDs and document fraud. He's very proud about his cleverness. His ego was high enough where he needed to vent every once in a while and get that feeling of success, admiration, look what I've done. When you know the truth, the truth will set you free. The partnership between Guthrie and Langan made the ARA a ticking time bomb. Well, it's sufficient to say to all you federal whores, You've been warned. Linger on this continent at your own peril. Nineteen ninety-three, Springdale, Ohio. Guthrie enlisted twenty-one-year-old Sean Kenny to help him case the Society National Bank. It was the ideal task for Kenny, a new dad. I'm basically working, I have a family, a young son, newlywed, and I'm certainly not in a position to run off and be part of some resistance movement because I'm just trying to earn a living at this point. After almost a year of surveillance, the ARA made its move. June 8th, 1994, 9 a.m. Guthrie and Peter Langan storm the Society National Bank. Get down! Get down! No arms, no hostages. It was the takeover type robbery. They wore president's masks. One was Nixon and one was Reagan, almost out of the movie Point Break. Guthrie nervously watched the clock as Langan approached the teller counter. Langan went over the counter, got the money, and they were out. And it took a very short period of time. In two minutes, the robbery was done. But as they sped away, they heard a loud pop. Red smoke filled the car. The big problem they had with this bank is that they got what's called a die pack. It was put in the bag when they grabbed up the money, and it exploded as they left so it often ruins their ability to utilize the funds that they take. Langan rolled down the window and threw out the dye-stained bills. They robbed that bank of around $11,000, and I think somewhere in the neighborhood of eight to 9,000, they ended up throwing out the window with the dye pack when it exploded. They kept the rest of the money and used part of it to pay Sean Kenny. Not all of it is ruined. With Guthrie's printing background knowledge, he knew of ways to clean these bills up. Some was ultimately given to me for my part of the job. The gangsters were convinced their revolution was on its way and that nothing could stop them. If they were ever confronted by the police or the federal authorities, they expected there to be a shootout. Langan and Guthrie both said that they would not be taken alive. It would be a long, hard struggle. And we intend to see this struggle through to the end. Columbus, the capital of the Buckeye State. The biggest city in Ohio, 
is home to a host of criminal organizations. We have gangs. Bank robberies has been historically an issue here. And surprisingly, we have quite a bit of terrorism. Among these terrorists is the Aryan Republican Army, or ARA. These were very professional bank robbers. Uh, along the lines of Jesse James or John Dillinger, they robbed 22 banks, stole about a quarter of a million dollars, never got caught during a bank robbery. But the masterminds behind the ARA had all American roots. Nineteen sixty-three, Saigon, Vietnam. Five-year-old Peter Langen's father was a CIA operative. His father had a huge influence on him, explaining how things aren't as they always seem. In 1964, the family resettled in Washington, D.C. When Langen came back to this country, people that we interviewed who knew him as a youngster said he was fluent in French and Vietnamese. Langen's father, his hero, died three years later. The nine-year-old was set on a self-destructive path. After his father died, Langen ran away from home, got arrested down in Florida for a robbery and spent five years in prison down there as a teenager. That's where he became violently anti-black. In prison, Langen protected himself by any means necessary. He'd grow his fingernails out long, hair out long, and look like a crazy wild man to defend himself in jail. He got out in 1979 and soon befriended 21-year-old Richard Lee Guthrie Jr., a soldier with a troubled past. Guthrie was in the Navy for a while and tried to get into the SEALs, but they rejected him. Guthrie purposely missed sailings in 1983 and was considered AWOL. He then painted a swastika on a Navy ship and was court-martialed. He was just very bitter towards the government. He just liked to stick it to the system. By the early 90s, Guthrie and Langen were immersing themselves in hate groups, which were gaining momentum in Ohio and Pennsylvania. Frank Mink grew up in South Philly's skinhead scene. We're going to make you proud to be white by teaching you how to hate everybody else and the reasons why everyone else is inferior. At 13, his abusive stepfather kicked him out of the house. He waited behind the wall, and as soon as I walked in, he just sucker punched me and just drug me up to my room and just beat the living crap out of me and told me, pack my stuff, you're moving out of here. Frank started spending time with family in rural Pennsylvania. There's Mennonites and people riding around on horse and buggies, and there's cows everywhere. That stuff to me is National Geographic. There, his cousin got him into the skinhead life. One of the first things I remember hearing was, multiracial society will never work. I remember that clear as day, and I just remember thinking, what's that mean? I don't know what multiracial society means. I'm 14 years old. By 1991, Frank was the leader of Pennsylvania's largest skinhead chapter. He began recruiting teens and spending time at a Christian identity compound in Amish country. These groups are drawn to Christian identity because it uses the name Christian. They see themselves at the top of the pecking order because they believe that Jews are inferior and blacks are inferior. It is useful to them because it gives them a sense of power. The compound was owned by a white nationalist named Mark Thomas. Christian identity has been a very, very small sect throughout history. At the compound, young skinheads like Mink learned to shoot guns and wage battle against the federal government. Everything that we were doing, paramilitary, whatever you want to call it, was preparing to be a good Christian soldier. One of those soldiers was Sean Kenny, who was looking to take his involvement to a new level. 
most were content just to drink and fight and party. It's all image, it's all for show. But a small number, the more cause-orientated ones, start saying, let's get more active. Kenny was attending a Christian identity church near Cincinnati when he met Peter Langan. Peter Langan approached me off to the side and basically said, hey, I'm a little bit more radical than these guys. Maybe we should get together sometime. Langan introduced Kenny to Richard Guthrie Jr., who was plotting to overthrow the government. Guthrie was apprehensive. These guys confided in themselves, but they didn't really want to confide in too many other people. Kenny earned Guthrie and Langan's trust by helping in several retail scams. I'm in their net because I'm doing some illegal things, so obviously I'm not someone they have to worry about because now I'm doing the same thing. In 1992, they decided to rob a Pizza Hut. Langan was arrested while Guthrie escaped. Detectives investigating the crime learned Guthrie was anti-government and that he had plotted to kill President George Bush. Yet they couldn't catch him. The detectives made a risky decision. And so now the Secret Service is looking for Guthrie. And it had been orchestrated that Langham would get out of jail and work for the Secret Service and trying to apprehend Guthrie. But these two guys are a lot closer than that. Langan met secretly with Guthrie and warned him about the feds. And then the two of them went out, and from that point, that was where they were back together again. And they had determined that, OK, we're running now by the Secret Service. That's not going to stop. And they decided, for whatever reason, to start really going big time. Together, Langan and Guthrie founded the Aryan Republican Army. Their intention was to fund the white supremacist movement and to ultimately achieve their goal of creating a white state for white people only. They were willing to overthrow the government violently. This wasn't going to be a peaceful takeover in their minds. And they were trying to fund it through the bank robberies. That was the start. On April 19th, 1993, the feds raided the Branch Davidian compound in Waco, Texas. At least 77 people, including 20 children, died in the battle. That backed up what the racist movement had been saying for years, that the feds were going to come and take us away and put us in these camps and take our guns away. The incident threw fuel on the ARA's fire. You just can't have a retreat mentality, because if you retreat, they're going to get you. So now, it starts justifying that you need to go on the offense. Any assassination massacred by generations of our people will be met with massive retaliation. Columbus, Ohio. This all-American city is home to the Aryan Republican Army, or ARA. A domestic terrorist gang with a plan to establish white rule. The gang has robbed a series of banks to fund its ultimate goal, toppling the federal government, which they refer to as ZOG. ZOG is Zionist occupied government. That's a very conspiratorial thought that the Jews run America and everything that happens in Washington is manipulated by Zionists from Israel. Basically, if you're not white, heterosexual, Christian, or whatever, then you're the enemy. The ARA lives by the ideals put forth in the white supremacist novel, The Turner Diaries. The most radical fringe of the white supremacists used the Turner Diaries as a blueprint on how to take over the United States government. That's the fictional account of a race lawyer. It gives you a good idea of what might be expected as the struggle heats up. The ARA also follows the principles of the order. 
The order is one of the most prominent and arguably the most lethal of neo-Nazi groups in American history. The order gained notoriety in 1984 when some of its members were linked to the murder of a Jewish talk radio host. They had plans to destroy government facilities, electric generating plants. They counterfeited money. They killed a law enforcement officer. So they were certainly no friend of the government as we know it. The order also paved the way for the ARA's revolution. You could learn from their mistakes, get the inspiration from the Turner Diaries, and then say, okay, how can we do this better? The ARA's membership is highly secretive. We're not one, but we're hundreds. Its members perform their crimes independently. It's a deliberate strategy. The gang calls a leaderless resistance. They're doing it on their own so that there's no ties back to ultimately one individual or one organization. The ARA's founders, Peter Langan and Richard Guthrie Jr., have unique roles. Langan would be more the bomb maker, the, the person responsible, I think, for the guns and the ammunition and maintaining the safe houses. He seemed to be more the logistics individual. Guthrie uses his knowledge of the printing business to create fake IDs, which bear the names of FBI agents. They would adopt their identity, get an ID in their name, and put like a getaway car in their name, their tongue-in-cheek way of saying to law enforcement, you didn't get me this time. Between robberies, gang members live separate lives at rented safe houses. They had a hideout here in the south side of Columbus. They had a hideout in Kansas. These hideouts are stocked with guns, explosives, and radios. The well-equipped revolutionary needs one of these more than an American Express. Radio scanners don't leave home without them. They were prepared. They had bombs. They had semi-automatic weapons. They had shotguns. They were heavily armed. The gang is methodical when committing robberies. You have SOP. Standard operating procedure is basically what happens repeatedly. And if you get these fundamentals down pat and right, it makes every job thereafter easier. There are rules of engagement, which the gang calls basic armed robbery techniques, or BART. The BART technique, you always find a location that's within three right turns of major roads, preferably highway. They always wear clever disguises. If the bank that they were robbing was around a holiday, they tried to dress up for the holiday, dressing up as Santa Claus. They also used disguises that were unique sometimes to the banks, where they would wear construction outfits to a certain robbery because they felt that that would fit in in a certain area. Each job is planned carefully. They would spend close to a month prior to a robbery selecting a location, uh, purchasing a getaway car, and then casing that particular location. And after they went through those steps, they would normally separate again and then get back together and go into the mode of actually robbing that bank. guys scared the heck out of tellers and patrons when they would charge into these banks with guns drawn, screaming and yelling. They're using real weapons. They're using real bombs. They're pointing those weapons within inches of people's face. They're dangerous. Guthrie patrols the lobby, timing how long it takes Langan to get the cash. They would have a stopwatch with them. They would yell out every 15 or 20 seconds how long they had before they had to escape again. Langham would run down the counter shouting, Andale, Andale, La Bamba, as if that would cause a witness to say it was a Hispanic person that robbed the bank. They're gone within 90 seconds, leaving behind an explosive device to divert attention. It is a bomb. They're going to move it. So they want everybody to move fast. 
That required them to evacuate the bank, to call the bomb squad, to remotely bring that particular device outside and remotely detonate it. And while they're doing that, the law enforcement then don't have the people trying to find the people who had just robbed the bank. By late 1994, the ARA had robbed more than six banks in five states. For a great deal of the time period, I thought, wow, this is great. We're basically following the footsteps of the order and living out the Turner Diaries. It's very exhilarating. The gang's exploits started to draw the attention of the feds. Now, Aura has conducted many successful operations today. And we haven't even come close to being spotted by security forces. They would send letters to newspapers throughout the Midwest taunting the FBI for not being able to capture them. That brought more heat on them because of the fact that it made us want to catch them that much more. But the ARA needed more manpower. They had hoped to create more cells, so they wanted to recruit as many people as possible because it is the Aryan Republican Army. It's not a group. They wanted an army. The gang soon produced a two-hour recruiting video to send to white supremacist leaders. Join our cause. We need you. The longer you watch it, the more you realize that there's a very scary message behind the whole thing. They were willing to talk about assassinating key figures. They had a photograph of Janet Reno, for example, on their bulletin board with a big X through it. As the ARA's ambitions grew, they asked Sean Kenny to introduce them to Mark Thomas, a racist preacher who recruited soldiers of hate on his private compound. I put them in contact with Mark Thomas, who would put them in contact with skinheads. With Thomas's help, the gang enlisted some skinheads who were associates of Frank Mink. We would walk out of Bible studies and be ready to go. This is our mission. The army was growing, and the real battle was about to begin. They had more people, they had more lookouts, they had getaway drivers. They were able to escalate what they were doing as they got more people involved. They're conducting the revolution, and it could turn out to be another Waco. Columbus, Ohio, 1994. The Aryan Republican Army and its new recruits were on a violent crusade to fund a white supremacist revolution. These guys are robbing banks here, they're robbing banks there, and nobody's driving around pink Cadillacs eating steak, everyone's giving it the cause. On June 8th, the ARA stormed the Society National Bank in Springdale, Ohio, wearing masks. Sean Kenny had helped ARA founder Richard Guthrie Jr. scout the bank before the attack. Sean Kenny himself never committed a robbery, although he made a number of what they called dry runs with Guthrie. Guthrie paid Kenny for his help. The cash had been cleaned, but still had residue from the red dye pack that exploded during the robbery. The money led the feds right to Kenny's door. It was the same area I had been living in when the Secret Service had came to me before, so they probably put two and two together that it was me that was utilizing it. The feds questioned Kenny, who refused to snitch on the ARA. But he was secretly doubting the gang's mission and its leaders, Peter Langan and Guthrie Jr. I actually really disillusioned at this point and not confident at all that these guys can pull off what they say they can pull off. I thought to myself, well, you know, somebody is going to get hurt. October 25th, Langan and Guthrie, dressed in construction gear, took over the Columbus National Bank. They were wearing hard hats, camouflage type masks with eye slits and sunglasses. 
Guthrie took his post in the lobby while Langan vaulted the counter. As he rifled through the drawers, Langan's mask fell, covering his eyes. And Langan was having trouble seeing through this and was trying to get into that last teller drawer, and he actually discards the majority of his disguise, the helmet, the glasses, and the camouflage face mask, and then gathers money out of that last teller station very near one of the tellers. The teller got a good look at Langan before he fled. And when they left, they left this pipe bomb sitting in the lobby in a lunchbox with a package of Twinkies on top to try to distract everyone as they made their getaway. The Twinkies were a joke, but the bomb wasn't. The bomb would have shot out shards and nails all over the area and probably killed anyone in the bank. More than 50 law enforcement officers responded to the scene. It is a frenzied sight for about an hour or so as they try to take care of it. Myself and a couple of other agents from my squad respond to that area along with the Columbus Fire Department bomb squad and then begin the investigation. It was very difficult uh, compared to most bank robberies. The gang's take was only three or four grand, but they made a clean getaway. By 1995, the FBI was actively investigating the robbers, whom they dubbed the Damn. Midwestern Bank Bandits. Though the bank teller had gotten a good look at Langan, authorities couldn't be certain who he was. This was one of the FBI's biggest cases and one of their most frustrating cases. It wasn't until a fellow named Sean Kenny contacted the FBI that they knew for certain who they were after. They caught a break when Kenny decided to come forward in April 1995. That's when Timothy McVeigh blew up the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City, killing 149 adults and 19 children. It's one thing to read stuff, it's one thing to maybe fantasize, but this stuff is really starting to happen. Kenny revealed to the FBI that ARA leaders Richard Guthrie Jr. and Peter Langan were the bank robbers they had long pursued. January 15, 1996. Kenny met ARA leader Richard Guthrie Jr. at a Cincinnati restaurant while FBI agents tailed them. So they decided to follow me to the location. And I'm waiting, and literally, I'm looking out the window as I see Guthrie in the van that he drove drive by, and I seen the agent's cars behind him. Guthrie spotted the feds and took off. They had to follow him, and they were pursuing him in his vehicle, but they were ultimately able to track him down. He pulled down into a cul-de-sac that he couldn't get out of, jumped out of his van, started running. Agents chased Guthrie down and arrested him. Not too long after that, Guthrie basically spilled the beans about the gang. He told him about Langan. He told him about the hideout in South Columbus. He told him about other gang members and where they might be located. The FBI prepared to take down Langan. January 18th, 1996. A dozen agents and a SWAT team descended on the ARA's headquarters in Columbus. Guthrie had warned us that Langan wouldn't be taken alive, that he had guns, explosives, bulletproof vest, and that it was something that we would have to be very careful about. Authorities moved cautiously, fearful of creating a firestorm. Guthrie does say to us, if we go in there, it could be another Waco. Agent Bill Davidge and his partner waited in the alley behind the house near Langan's white van. Our plan was to allow Langan to come out, block the re-entry to the house so that he couldn't get back inside, and arrest him either in the van behind the house or in the alley as he was leaving that area. FBI surveillance captured Langan leaving the house. Walking back toward the van. 
Okay, he is at the van. He's at the van. Stand by. Driver's door is opening. He's getting in. He sits in the vehicle for a short period of time, not moving, doesn't appear that he started the vehicle. The agents moved in. Move that down, let's go right now. My partner starts yelling out commands for him to give up. FBI, police, show us your hands. And he seems like he's being compliant. He was making an assessment of how outnumbered he was. What he did was he jumped backwards from the front of the van over the seats into the back of the van and then came up in a two-handed assault-type stance with a handgun drawn. I hear a gunshot that I thought came from inside the van and I fire three shots from my shotgun at Langen. The other agents opened fire, peppering the van with 48 rounds. There was silence, a van riddled with bullets, and every law enforcement agent there believed he had to be dead. There's a short pause, and then all of a sudden, we start to hear a response from inside the van. Wounded, Langen called out to the agents. I can see that he's got blood streaming down his face, and there's a wound right underneath one of his eyes. Lay down, lay down. What's your name? What's your name? I want to talk to a lawyer. Get an ambulance. Roll an ambulance. Agents found the van outfitted for war. The van was built up with cabinets of some kind on both sides. In those cabinets were weapons and ammunition. That very thing may have saved his life. The van held more than a thousand rounds of ammo, and Langen's house yielded even more. There were bomb-making materials, gunpowder, switches, timers, pipes, wires, strewn throughout the house. Afterwards, the FBI described that house as a bomb-making factory. There was definitely an inordinate number of guns, ammunition, bulletproof vests, pipe bombs for the average bank robbery group. But it wasn't until Langen was taken to the hospital that agents learned a shocking secret. We talked to some of the gang members about that, and had they known that he was up to that, likely they would have killed him. January 1996, the leaders of a gang of domestic terrorists, the Aryan Republican Army, were taken into federal custody. Last week, two individuals were arrested, Richard Lee Guthrie Jr., Peter Kevin Langan, who are suspected of being involved in a series of bank robberies that have been committed in six different Midwestern states over the last two years. Langen, who was wounded during a shootout with the FBI, was taken to the hospital. There, doctors made an astounding discovery. That was when they noticed his long fingernails. That's when they noticed that all of his body hair, including the hair around his groin area, had been shaved clean. He had an entirely different agenda and a hidden lifestyle that none of us knew about until well after he was captured. Langen led a double life. When he wasn't running the ARA, he lived as a woman named Donna. This had been something he'd been doing for a while. This ain't somebody just thrown on a wig and put in a dress. This was someone who was really trying to be a woman. Prosecutors believe Langen's sexuality was a ruse. He claimed to be a transsexual. And that was one of his primary defenses to try to get out of the charges, to say, how could I be a white supremacist if I really feel that I am a woman inside a man's body? The ARA began falling apart. In July, Richard Guthrie Jr. was called to testify against Langan. Richard Guthrie, at that point, was our glue that put everything together. He was the one that was going to explain how the robberies occurred, who was involved. He never made it to court. The day before his appearance, 
Guthrie hung himself in his jail cell. The suspicion is that he feared that because he had ratted out Langan and the rest of the uh, gang members, that he would be assassinated in prison. Former will be dealt with ruthlessly, permanently. Peter Langan was tried for both the Springdale and Columbus robberies and for assaulting federal officers. The cases against Langan were the epitome of an open and shut case. He was caught during a shootout with FBI and local police. You had witnesses, you had fellow gang members turning state's evidence on him. There was never any doubt. Langan was convicted and sentenced to life plus 35 years in prison. Langan stuck to his claim that he's a woman trapped in a man's body. He petitioned to have the surgery to enable him to physically become more like a woman. That has not been granted, but he certainly has tried. Four more members of the ARA were sentenced to time in prison, including several with ties to Frank Mink. Mink has since renounced his racist views. When I was putting out negative violence, hatred, it always came back to me. Once I started putting out love and positive and respect, it always came back to me. He's now a published author and a speaker with the Anti-Defamation League. Still, the ARA's legacy lives. Conspiracy theorists believe the ARA helped fund the Oklahoma City bombing. The FBI acknowledged that they questioned a number of the ARA members about whether there are any links between any of them and Timothy McVeigh. So even the FBI at one time was interested in a possible link. Is it possible they crossed paths? Is it possible they were involved? I can't say it's not. Sean Kenny, he's no longer associated with the ARA or its views. I've chosen my family all over the cause. And so I felt that I've done my part and I can walk away from this and go on with my life. He served in the military and as a private contractor in Iraq. There was an opportunity in the military to uh, get my tattoos uh, removed. Uh, I had various, you know, tattoos that were associated with my skinhead gang affiliation. It's excruciating, but it's kind of uh, atonement for my sins. Kenny now holds a steady job and has no regrets about helping to bring down the ARA. I'm not apologetic about anything I've done in my past. It's that I was able to be intelligent enough and mature enough when shown a new truth to go in a different direction. For my family's sake, for my sake, I'd done exactly the right thing. Even so, his past haunts him. There is no dress rehearsals in life. Every day, what you're doing is going to affect you down the road. You're either going to fight or you're going to submit. And I don't care basically what you say. The revolution is growing and growing every day.